So I've been tasked with giving the how I do it talk, but I've broken down my two talks for the Eurolift and ITIN into different parts. I'm going to talk about why I do it, how it's done, how I do it, and then the results around it. So just keep that framework in mind. I am a <clears throat> excuse me, consultant to Teleflex Olympus and Lena Med, who have no influence on in these talks. I'm also an advisor for Roe. So why I do it for, and this is really for both therapies, so you're going to see a little bit of uh, repetitive nature to this, but if we look at medical therapies, as Dr. Zorn and Dr. Bianca mentioned, patients don't want to be on medical therapy, and a large portion of them will end up stopping their meds and being non-compliant. So up to three quarters of patients when they're given an alpha blocker or 5-alpha reductase inhibitor will come back and not be on that medication because they just uh, weren't tolerating the side effects or they didn't want to commit to lifelong medical therapy. So there's a very high dropout rate and high dissatisfaction. And the conversion to surgical therapy is also low because of historic fears about the sequelae, morbidity associated with a lot of the procedures that we've offered in the past, like TERP, uh, incontinence, strictures, et cetera, et cetera. So to be able to offer a bridge therapy that allows patients an easier mindset to be agreeable to do something a little more aggressive than medical therapy, get them off medications and avoid the side effects, has become a very attractive feature. In terms of the ITIN procedure and how it's done, the procedure involves an expandable nitinol stent that's pulled into the prosthetic urethra. It has three arms to it. There's a 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock, and 12 o'clock strut that put pressure on the prostate. And the way that I explain it to patients is that I give them the analogy of putting your hand on a memory foam pillow. When you put your hand on a memory foam pillow, the pillow keeps that shape. But with this, it keeps it for longer than what a memory foam pillow would do, but it molds to the configuration of the stent. When the stent is placed, it's kept in for about five to seven days, and then afterwards we remove it, typically under just a little bit of uh, local anesthesia. We put some Eurojets in, and then we're able to slide it through a 22 French council tip catheter. This is a video. I'm not sure if I can pull it up, but we'll try. Oh, I guess not. Okay, that's okay because we have another video. There's another one built in. So it was a, an animation of how the ITIN is done and the, the steps around it, but it's actually fine because we've got redundancy. So in terms of the indications for who we use it on, so the indications for use, it's important to keep a lot of these things in mind because insurance companies can sometimes push back and say that they won't cover if you don't fit the indications prescribed. It should be for men who have urinary symptoms due to BPH over the age of 50, and it should be avoided in men who have active urinary tract infections, a history of artificial urinary sphincters, other conditions that could be causing their obstruction, prostate cancer, bladder cancer, although I think prostate cancer may be on the table to be uh, taken off in the future. And if they have bladder outlet obstruction with a totally dysfunctional atonic bladder, then that's not a patient that's going to do well uh, with an ITIN that's recommended against. But for my mind and the way that I conceptualize it, I think of the ideal patient as anybody 80 grams or less without a median lobe, and preferentially if they have a, an elevated bladder neck. So those are the, the key features that I look for to see if the patient that I'm scoping is going to be ideal for Eurolift or ITIND or other procedures. But keep those features in mind. In terms of assessing median lobe, whenever I do cystoscopy on patients and I do transrectal ultrasounds, I am looking specifically at the median lobe. And when I do my cystoscopies, I retroflex, and I use the width of the telescope as my guide to know how much median lobe there is inside the bladder. So if the width of the telescope is about five millimeters, and I see that when I retroflex, there's about three widths of the telescope intravesical extension, to me that's a 15 millimeter intravesical protrusion, not a candidate for eye tint. But if they have one width of the telescope protrusion, to me that is appropriate. But you can also confirm that with the transrectal ultrasound and, and gives you a better sense. Five millimeters is okay, up to 10 can be tried, but I wouldn't recommend it over 10. I believe the company is also shares in that restriction. These are some pictures showing what the I-10 would look like inside of a, a patient with no median lobe, with a small median lobe, and then a patient who's not a candidate on the right side with a very large median lobe. So as you can see, where the I-10 struts sit, it's gonna put pressure on the five o'clock, seven o'clock, and if you've got a large median lobe, it's going to just accentuate that median lobe even more. So it's not going to help them. It's just going to c 
continue with their problem. But a patient that would do well with an ITIND is a patient where you go into their prosthetic urethra and you're deflecting up to get into their bladder. Now, one way that I tell my residents on how to gauge whether or not there is an elevated bladder neck or not is when you're putting the scope in, you're looking at the crevices on the left side, right side to see if there's a commissure. If there's no commissure, that tells you probably just a high bar. And then when you're in the bladder, if you can easily deflect the scope down, and see the UOs, then that's not an elevated bladder neck or may not be an elevated bladder neck. But if you are struggling to see the UOs, that's a very high bladder neck. And that could be a patient who would respond well to ITIND, assuming that they don't have an elevated uh, intravesical extension or, or prosthetic lobe protruding. This was a patient that I took care of in the past. He was a 56-year-old male who had come to me for urinary symptoms. Despite being on uh, Flomax and Proscar, he had a, an IPSS score of 27 with a high bother score. The primary reason for his visit was not necessarily the IPSS score. It was more the sexual dysfunction that he was experiencing with Proscar and his wish to get off of it. His prostate was of a medium size, 55 grams. And when I scoped him, he had about a three centimeter prostatic length, a high riding bladder neck, and a small diverticulum in his bladder, no median lobe. And I drew, a, I always take pictures of all my cystoscopies so that I remember exactly what I saw. And in this case, the bladder neck was so remarkable to me that I, I, I drew a picture and I put on a sticky note and I included that in his records to remind myself when I go in there what I'm going to be looking at. But what you see here in the top two photos is basically you're coming into the prosthetic urethra and there's just a wall of prosthetic urethra in front of you. So this is the actual procedure for this patient. In the interest of time, I'm going to fast forward through parts of this. Okay. Yeah. So you can see the climb. You can't really see because you can't see my hands, but I'm going straight up. You can see the trabeculation of the bladder, and then the UOs aren't easily visible. So we disassemble the scope, and then through the 22 French cystoscope sheath, we can put the ITIN device, remove the cystoscope, and then with the ITIN still in the, in the urethra, we put the scope back in adjacent to it. And then we, so now you can see the ITIN device in the urethra. The blue line should always be facing at 12 o'clock, and that's how you know the, the orientation of the ITIN. So as we go in, we Go into the bladder. <clears throat> okay, and here you can see the ITIN device in the bladder in just a moment. It really helps. So here you can see the, the struts of the eye tint, and what you're going to see there's a 6 o'clock leaflet that will be its anchor so it doesn't move back into the bladder. So what you're going to see is I'm going to basically position the eye tint device within the prosthetic urethra, trying to leave the 6 o'clock leaflet adjacent to the vera montanum and about a centimeter proximal to it. So you can see the metal of the leaflet on the bottom, and then you see the struts coming into the prosthetic urethra. The secret and the tip with this, the one thing that I want you guys to take as a take home, is the more you pull the ITIN device into the prosthetic urethra, the better the outcome will be. Because where the ITIN device expands, there's more pressure at the furthest tips of it. So if you haven't pulled it completely into the prosthetic urethra, you're only getting part of the ITIN device putting pressure on the 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock, and 12 o'clock. But if you pull it all the way in a position as far as you can, you get a lot more tension on the tissue and a lot firmer press on the memory foam pillow. Like this is the biggest part of the surgery. If this is everything you've done, everything's set up, this is the surgery. You're pulling back and you're looking for that shepherd's hook. That's right. And you're going to see that come over the bladder neck there. And like that, that's, that's it. And I think you're... Yeah. 
Nice, vi nice video. Thank you. So what we're going to see is as soon as the, oh, okay, we're almost done. So as soon as the six o'clock leaflet sits right on top of the Vera Montanum, that's how I know that we're in the right position. We check the five o'clock, seven o'clock, and 12 o'clock. Okay, I think you guys get the idea. All right, so if we look at the data, Dr. Chaktai is going to be talking later on. Uh, so this was one of his studies, and this slide was borrowed from Olympus. But it shows the outcomes of large data sets that have looked at men who have gone through ITIN and either in single-arm prospective studies or randomized control trials. And what we're seeing in the three trials with large data sets is that there is a significant reduction in IPSS scores and almost a doubling of the Qmax and that is durable up to three years, and that's the extent of data that we have. And the retreatment rate that we're seeing in the three-year data set is about 9%. So if we look at the IPSS reduction across the studies, a 58% reduction in IPSS, and a peak flow improvement of 114% improvement, so it's doubling the peak flow and 8.7% retreatment. In terms of how I practice, uh, when I see a patient who has an 80 gram or less prostate, I look at a couple different things. When I do the cystoscopy, if their prostate's small, high riding bladder neck, that patient is preferentially going to go towards eye tint. If they have a firm prostate or they've got a more irregular, lobulated prostate, more likely I'm going to push them towards your lift because I can tailor my treatment to those lobes of the tissue of bulging. And then if they've got a spongy prostate, like Dr. Zorn had mentioned, where we're not really sure if that patient is the best candidate for a Eurolift where the tissue may fold, then Resume might be better or ITIN might be better in that case so it resorbs the tissue. And if they're over 80 and they wish to preserve sexual function, then uh, there are a number of different treatments that can be offered. So I appreciate your attention. Thank you.